morning. Oh, good morning on this um, Mother's Day. Now, could anybody tell me the origin of Mother's Day? Pardon? Called Mothering Sunday. Come on, any guesses? Uh, in the Catholic uh, Church, yeah, it's linked to, to, to Mary, but again, there's a reason why it's linked to Mary. But anybody else? So you think it's to do with mothers? Yeah. Come on, give us some thought. Anything to do with mothers? <laughs> there we are. Actually, it wasn't. The reason for Mother's Day is because. Um, they used to have these lots of little churches around the place. And Mothering Sunday was where the folks in their little churches would go back to the big church. The cathedral. Or, or whatever it was. Um, and then they would all meet together there. And another reason why they met together there was because in the British culture, servants, the working class maybe, the servants, were allowed to go back to their church in their hometown and spend time with their mothers and the family. And it rolled from there. So people who normally didn't get time off, they were allowed to um, have uh, time off. So there we are. Let's roll up in our commercial world to be to do with the um, mothers. Um, for some people, it's a lovely day. And for some folks, it's a very hard day. Um, uh, for some dads who do the mothering, just as on Father's Day, mothers who do the fathering, um, and for some folks who've lost their mothers, um, there's a whole range. So as you go through the day, pray for those, maybe, that you can recall who find today a hard day. Um, um, a lot of our families, um, they've gone off, um, they've texted us and everything, they've gone off, and they're with um, their families in different places. Uh, around the world, around the world, around the UK, um, pray for them uh, as well. Flowers. Um, the tulips. We will be giving out tulips. We will be giving out tulips. You can keep yourself or maybe give to someone who finds it a, a, a hard day, if that's the case. Um, did you know that Jesus had a, had a mother's heart as well? In Psalm, in, in <coughs> What, from, for me, with um, going through Lent, what I do is I look, I go through the Gospels at the moment. And from Good Friday, in each Gospel, I take ten chapters before that, which relate to me for ten days, and I read through them. Um, and I go through each of the Gospels. And one of them, it talks about where Jesus is in Jerusalem, and he's looking at Jerusalem. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stone those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. A hen gathers her brood, a mother's heart, under her wings. But then he says, you are not willing. The Lord today would ask, are we willing to come under those wings? Of Jesus to be gathered to him. It was interesting yesterday. Claire, did you want to say anything about? No, you don't want to say anything about yesterday. He does. Let me just show you. Um, can you pop that video up? God is at work. We had few of us breakers, and God sent us the most amazing team who are multi-talented in different things and we just have and, and he sent those people specifically because you couldn't have chosen you couldn't have found those people if you'd actually gone to try and pick them and we spent two days flat out baking not one crossword not anybody standing by anybody else's toes and getting uptight that has to be a hope the Holy Spirit and then yesterday we were supposed to be open from 11 till half past 1. <laughs> By about half past 11, quarter to 12, we were sold out. 
and there was piles and piles and piles of bread. And I don't know what our final total will be. It will probably be over a thousand, just over a thousand pounds to go to West Barks Community. What's it called? Yes. Yes. The therapy Centre, which are two guys who have had strokes and um, come to, they, they, they can't use their left side. So they go to that centre. So it's it's amazing. And, and God has been good to us, hasn't he? I mean, it's just been the most, it was the most amazing thing to watch, mm -hmm. where there was just people everywhere, people sitting in here, for ages, some of them just sitting. Um, there was one lady who told Lynn, Lindsay, she's the granny of one of the ladies who comes from the ark, and she just said when she comes in here, she feels like she's had a hug. Um, and some of the other, the, the mothers of some of our bakers, the one lady said to, said to me, um, this lady just loves coming in here. She just loves it. So God is good and God is at work. They might, those people might just be on the journey, they're not believers. They might just be on the journey, and it might be the first step on the journey, but he has his finger on all of those ladies. And so I just thank God for those ladies. I thank God for how he worked in all of us as a team, um, and it was just the most amazing privilege to be part of the team. So, thank you. Um, to check up on the uh, newsletter, just to reiterate, um, I was sitting up here with Dennis and I were sitting together up here. There's a family by the side and they were chatting, wanted to know what was going on. They didn't know about this place. Um, it was lovely to see and they talked about coming in waves. Well, there wasn't any wave yesterday. It all just came. It all just came. Uh, told them. So the uh, car park is a bit muddy. Hopefully it'll dry out. But that's because of all the cars that were coming and coming back and forth. It was really, really um, lovely to see. Another thing for you to, if you've got a newsletter and kind of link into your, um, your calendar, is the Henry Arts Trail. And we have several artists here who will again, we we'll have that space where uh, the art will be up and people will be coming back and forth. So spread the news on that as well so that you can, um, uh, people can come to that as well. Um, and it'd be good to be, um, yeah. There are flyers over there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, flyers and little books around which um, it'd be good to uh, <laughs> take and um, share. Lindsay will be finishing off Gideon uh, this afternoon. Later on, so yeah. not this afternoon. no, I stopped saying this afternoon. I think everybody's got other things going on this afternoon. Um, so yeah, feel free, and I'll take the little ones outside. But we're going to go into a time of worship. And just remember that uh, that scripture where Jesus said, "How often." Have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And said to Jerusalem, You were not willing. And we, as we worship the Lord, as we spend time in singing, be willing to come under his wings and allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. In the um, newsletter, it also talks about coming with the a word of encouragement, and there will be times if anybody has a psalm, a song, or a word of encouragement to share that as we go through this morning. <clears throat> Let's see if this goes. Yes. So we're going to be. Please stand uh, or sit, however you would like to reflect.
for those who don't have those opportunities and are mm -hmm. um, controlled in what they say and speak. But we thank you, Lord, that you are here today. A hen is a safe place for the chicks to run to. But also, a hen calls the chicks to come into that place of safety. us to walk with him and filled with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in this world in which we live. Each day we can know that <coughs> guides and leads us.
friend that you know is someone you would love to call on the name of the Lord to come and be their guide. of safety covered by wings. Uh, Chicks, people, um, we can actually make a, they make a loud sound. In a place of safety, but in that place of safety, they can all be spread.
anybody have a uh, psalm or an encouragement that they'd like to, to share? Outside, and you pray for us out there. We have looking at Gideon and some of the stuff that Gideon was involved in. And Lindsay will um, share with you about Gideon. <coughs> Let me pray. Father, you are our protector, mental, physical, and spiritual protector. And we know that we go through highs and lows, but you're with us through all of those times, all those places. You know us full well. And yes, we need to have our minds transformed, Lord. There is a repenting and leaving behind the old to walk into the new with you, being led by your Holy Spirit. So I pray for each one of us to treat them to praise as we go through this week. Lord. May you be glorified. May your words echo in our minds. May we rest covered, covered by your wings. Find that peace, Lord. Peace that passes all understanding. Peace that will lead us and guide us through everything. And also be able to express that love, which we saw yesterday, Father. Someone said when they came in here, it's like being hugged. Your presence is here. Guide us and lead us that we would take that into those that are hurting in this world, Father, so that they would know, taste and see. Mother's Day uh, that the lovely Rosary wrote. Um, Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you formed my inmost being. You led me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Holy One, we gather in your presence to give you thanks and to celebrate the gift of your love, a love that supports, nurtures, and challenges us in ways that strengthen and transform us. We offer you praise and thanksgiving for your unfailing presence in our lives and all of the blessings that you so generously offer us. We lift up before you, Lord, all members of our human family around the world, for those who are ill or suffering at this time, for those who need healing, for those who require bread or shelter or clean water, for those who live in violent homes and communities that are unsafe, for those who are grieving, and for those whose needs are known to you alone. We remember in a few moments' silence those situations and people who are on our hearts at the moment. May we always appreciate being able to be part of a church. We pray for all the churches in our area, as well as our home church in Springwater. We ask you to continue to guide our leaders sustain, support, and bless us as we move forward in this changing world with all the initiatives, pro initiatives, projects, and challenges 
that make this place a special, god for place that it is. Please give us energy and wisdom in all we do, and remind us to stay close to you in prayer. We pray for our world, our government, and our royal family, and may your desire for us, your people, and your world become clear. In all situations in this world of strife, conflict, disease, and love, help us remember that everyone affected has a mother. We pray for all people to ask that you bring comfort and healing. Today, as we celebrate Mother's Day, we give thanks for mothers the world over. We give, th we give thanks for all those who have nurtured and cared for us, remembering especially birth mothers, adopted mothers, aunts, grandmothers, teachers, neighbors, and all women who have taken on the role of mothering for us. We pray compassionate God for those who have been denied the longed for chance at motherhood and for those whose years of mothering have been cut short by the loss of a child. We pray for all who have suffered a miscarriage, for mothers and children estranged from each other, for all those who mother in situations of poverty and violence, Lord, we bring to you all women who mother whatever their circumstances. We also pray for our spiritual mothers and those who have shown us the reality of Jesus. We pray for loving mothers, for mothers who do not know how to be kind and loving, for brave mothers, for mothers who have died. Dear Lord, hear our prayers. Loving God, as fathers, as mothers, as children, we ask your blessings as we bring our prayer to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Romans 15 to, first, 15 to 13. May the God of hope fill you with the joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 16, verse 7. We will praise the Lord who counsels me even at night. My heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Amen. Yes, yeah, so Kevin had to go out to help with the children today, so I'm going to take over from where Tricky left off. Those um, scriptures that Tricky just read were given by Ruth during the time of worship. Um, absolutely spot on for the whole of the service, so thank you. So I'm going to pray before we start, while we get ready with the PowerPoint. Let me pray. Father, I know we've prayed for the children, but Lord, we just lift up Kevin and, Drew and Amy Lee and the, the children, the boys, as they're out there. Father, would they have fun, but would they learn about you? Would they, would they start to understand more and more about what it is to have that incredible relationship with you? And I pray for Kevin as he leads what Nikki has prepared. And uh, just thank you for his willingness to do that and his willingness to prepare even when she's doing it. And I pray for us that we hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Thanks, Marianne. The reason I brought the stool up is um, I feel a bit of a visual aid for my own talk this morning. Um, because it's all about weakness. And I um, need to see the doctor this week because of a chest infection and I'm waiting a chest x-ray. Um, and so I'm just feeling a bit wobbly physically, so I walk the stool up thinking if I start to feel too wobbly, I will sit down rather than fall over, which might be a little disruptive for us. So last week, I started thinking I'd finish it, but it was, it was too long and there was lots of other things going on, as, um, talking about Gideon. I know that many of you are here. I am going to recap a bit. I'm trying not to sort of be too repetitive, but just to recap for those that I forgot or weren't here or haven't been able to watch it online. But I also began last week by saying that I had to deal, I was beginning to deal with quite a lot of discouragement on a Sunday morning because I remember it's alone. And I've been talking to God about this over the last few weeks and I felt like God said, you need to look at the story of Gideon. So I started to look at the story of Gideon and found out that God had a lot to say to me about it. And I think probably a lot to say to us. So here's a quick summary of where, what we covered last week. Because we did leave Gideon in rather a predicament at the end of last week. 
The Israelites had been, they were being besieged by the Midianites, that was a massive army of 135,000 people, as well as, if you remember, lots and lots of camels, a very intimidating sight. Um, and these Midianites would invade with their herds and their tents, coming like a swarm of locusts, so that no one could count them or their camels. They came into the land to destroy it. An army of 135,000 men plus camels. So the context is the Israelites living in fear, cowering before this massive intimidating army that was slowly destroying them, using warfare of basically just crop destruction, still happens today. That intimidating, fear-mongering way of destroying an enemy, very effective. And I highlighted that sometimes God allows these hard times so that we will be drawn back to realize that he is the one who can save us, to bring us to our knees. So that's a good place to be on our knees. It's a painful place to be, but it's a good place to be. And that's where the Israelites were, the start of this story, on their knees, desperately asking God to rescue them. And enter Gideon. So big brave Gideon was hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat, so that's the wine press, that's where he should have been threshing wheat. And he was hiding because he was scared of the Midianites. And an angel of the Lord comes to him and says, basically, the Lord is with you, you mighty warrior. And we talked last week about he didn't really look like a mighty warrior, he wasn't acting like a mighty warrior. But the point being, if the Lord is not with you, you're not a mighty warrior. It's because the Lord is with you that you're a mighty warrior. And one of the high, I highlighted the point that we need to speak life as God sees it, looking at life with the eyes of faith and not fear. When God sees the idiot, he doesn't see the cowering, fearful man hiding from his enemies. He sees someone he can work through to become the leader and deliverer that he needs to rescue his people from the enemy. God sees who he is. He's a mighty warrior because God is with him. <coughs> That's the reason. Gideon's not quite acting like the mighty warrior just yet. But let's be honest, when God asks us to do, says we've got a big role he, he wants us to play, is our response, great, yeah, tell me what to do. Mine's usually, uh, sorry God, I think you've got the wrong person. Isn't that how we feel? How am I feeling at the moment? Because what Gideon says to God is, if you're with us, why doesn't it look like that? And I think that is something that I have really been challenged by recently. Okay, God, if you're with us, why are we only a few people on a Sunday morning? Well, let's see what God has to say about that. And Gideon's next response is, I'm too weak to do this. And God totally ignores him and basically says, am I not personally sending you? I'm sending you. I'm with you. That's what makes you strong enough to be able to do this. On our own, we are weak, but with God, we are mighty warriors. And I honestly think this is one of the key points that God wants to say to us as a church. But also as individuals, what he's saying to us is, I don't see your fear, I see your strength. And I think it's really important that we hear that. I see your strength because I am with you. That's what God is saying. And I am sending you to do what I've asked you to do. On our own, we are weak, but with God, we are mighty warriors. Don't look at our weakness, look at our strength in God. And then we have the first of three tests, because God meets Gideon exactly where he is. He doesn't condemn him for needing assurance, but Gideon does need a bit of assurance, and really quickly, he goes off and he prepares an offering, he makes lots of bread, remember 16 kg, I think it was worth of bread last week. Um, and he presents this to the, to the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord reaches out his staff, and the whole thing burns up. And Gideon's like, oh boy, oh boy, now what have I done? Now I've seen God and I'm going to die. And I think two things from this bit. Like that says, God meets us exactly where we are. He meets every single one of us exactly where we are. But we need to also look at people in that way. We don't need to expect them to be of a certain maturity, of a certain age, or a certain whatever, to be able to do what God wants them to do. God meets them exactly where they are. He's like he's saying, I can see this in you, and if you'll let me walk alongside you, we can do this together. But when Gideon saw what happened to his offering, he got really scared. 
And I think that's another challenge. It's a real challenge to me. Do we sometimes focus on the negative effect of something God has done rather than seeing the bigger picture? And I have an illustration that happened yesterday, which I have to confess to the bakers who worked so incredibly hard for this incredible day. It was unbelievable. I walked in about half past 11 because I was caught on a phone call. The place was packed of people buying, drinking, eating cinnamon buns. It was amazing, some really good conversations going on. And I went to get myself a coffee. And I was more upset that it was instant coffee than I was at how excited it was. It was like the whole day was. And God said, look at what I am doing. Don't focus on the things you don't like. So there's my heart bed to you all. <laughs> I didn't even drink it. I took it back. It was so disgusting. <laughs> Instant coffee should not be allowed. So, real challenge. I mean, there's humour, but it is a real challenge. So, that night, Gideon's first task. That's right, sorry. I did get a bit mixed up with my slides. At least they're working this week. <laughs> all God wants for us to do is to say yes. That's all he needs us to do, is if he says, I want you to do this. All he wants is us to say yes, and he's going to do the rest. We just have to put our hands in his and he'll take us where we need to go. Main thing was Gideon obeyed. That's the first thing God wants. And that's where pretty much where we ended, picking up from verse 33 in Judges 6. All the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So all this massive army of 135,000 men and all their camels are camped in this valley. This is Jezreel. It's actually, obviously today, because the buildings are there. It's a very common site for big battles in the Bible because of its situation. So this massive army has come down from the south, near south where Saudi Arabia is, all the way up to the east, gathering people on their way, and they come into Israel right smack in the middle of where all the Israelite, Israelite tribes are. I don't know if you can see where it says Megiddo. Megiddo? I don't know if you can see, it might be too small, about sort of just above halfway up. Megiddo is where we get the word Armageddon. It's where John in Revelation would have been thinking about when he was talking about Armageddon. Very common site for big battles and a very intimidating place to be. And Gideon sends out a call for arms, a call for men to join him to fight this massive army. So we've got, in a very, very crass sort of illustration, the Midianite army and the little Gideon army, the Israelite army. And do you remember I said the Holy Spirit came, came upon Gideon and the literal translation was the Holy Spirit dressed himself in Gideon. Love that picture because I think it is so humbling to think that all we are is an outfit for the Holy Spirit to be to, to actually invade and take and take control of. So the Holy Spirit has, has invaded Gideon basically. And he gets his army together. But Gideon's still very much there. He's still very much weak. And I very quickly told you last week about the tests, so I'll just quickly do it again. The two tests which we know well, most of us I'm sure about the fleeces. First fleece has got to be he puts it out and he says, I want you, God, to make it wet and the ground around it to be dry. Next morning, he wakes up and yes, of course, the fleece is wet and the ground is dry. And Gideon probably thinks, well, actually, of course, that would happen because the fleece is soak up water. So let's do the opposite. The fleece needs to be dry and the ground all around it needs to be wet. The next night, next morning, he gets up. Exactly that had happened. And he finally realizes, yes, God is the one he's talking to. God is going to do what he needs him to do. And I think we have to have grace for Gideon and ourselves when we need those signs of assurance. I know I said this last week, the Bible talks about not putting the Lord your God to the test. But that's that sort of pharisaical, you prove that you're God and then I'll do what you say. But the attitude of Gideon is, I'm really scared. I can't do this unless you really are who you say you are. So he's got his army. It's about 32,000. And as you can see, it's pretty small compared to the Midianite army. But he's in a better place. He knows he can trust God. But God actually has something to say to Gideon at this point. Because all the time Gideon is saying, has been testing 
God. And now God is actually saying, okay, I'm going to test you now. How much do you actually trust me? And so now we're in chapter 7, and he thinks God is army, and he thinks, great, it's 32,000 against 135, still ridiculously small, but we've got God on our side, so that'll be okay. But God actually says, if you defeat the Midianites with this army, you're going to think it's your victory. The world is going to think it's your victory. I need this to look like it's my victory. I need the whole world to know that this is me who has done this. So he says, verse literally says, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. I just love that picture. You've got, you've got 32,000 men on all my face trembling with fear. I just think it's a great picture. Well, 22,000 of those trembling men leave, leaving Gideon with 10,000. And it is important that the victory is seen to be God's. Because God wants people to see him. He wants people to be drawn to him. He doesn't want people to be drawn to a great church a great Sunday, a great bake sale, a great ark. He wants people to be drawn to him. We must never lose sight of that. And so he tells these trembling men, literally one of the words is unsteady, on their feet. He tells them to leave and 22,000 leave. And he leaves back with 10,000. Fear is contagious. And God needs to clear out the people who are scared. Because when we're facing a spiritual battle, he wants to show his power, and fear can stop us from seeing it. But Gideon's probably thinking, this is ridiculous. It was a small army anyway, now it's ridiculously small. How on earth are we going to do this? But at least it's now an army of people who aren't hesitant and fearful, because that can really change the effect of an army. But God's not finished. He sets another test. He says, sorry, you've still got too many people. Take them down to the river, and I'm going to weed out the ones you don't need. And then we have this very strange test where he takes them down to the river, known as the lappers versus the non-lappers. Basically, there's different variations on this verse as to what the translation actually means, but it's probably something like, some of them go down to the river and they stick their faces right down into the water, Others, and they kneel to get right down to the water, and others crouch by the water and gather, gather it up and lap it up like a dog. I thought, I'll be honest, when I, start, when I started thinking of this story, I was sure the crux of the message was going to be on this verse. But actually, whichever way you look at this, whether it's lappers or non-lappers or whatever, it doesn't matter. Because the reality is, it took, took the army down to 300 people against an army of 135,000 men, plus all the camels. Can't we get the camels? In actual fact, this is probably a better proportion. One Israelite to 450 Midianites. Can you imagine? So what are we, 15, 20 people today? So whatever that would be. Say an army of a thousand people suddenly started coming against us with their guns and their swords, we'd run a mile, wouldn't we? 300 men against 135,000, the equivalent of one against 450. God really wanted to make it clear it was going to be his victory. And these aren't superheroes like we see in the Marvel films, these are average men. Average men who've been dist distinguished from the others in whether they could lap or not. I don't think, never seen that in the military handbook. Not that I have too much experience with military handbooks, I would admit. But if any of you have, don't think that lapping is a test for soldiers. But basically, the more average we are, the weaker we are, the more God's power can work. And that's the crux of this story. God had said to Gideon before he reduced the army from 32,000 to 10,000, I need this to be my victory and not yours. And with these 300 men against 132,000, he says, I need it to be really, really clear that this is my victory and not yours. 
So another confession, second confession of the morning. I am a counter, and up until last Sunday, I always count how many people there are on Sunday morning, and how many people who are not here who would normally be here. And doing this, preparing for this message, God has really challenged me, saying, stop looking. Stop looking at that. That isn't what shows what I'm doing. Stop looking at the numbers. The last week I didn't count, and I haven't counted this morning. And I don't want anyone to tell me if they have counted. Because <laughs> one of the messages God has been saying to us, while Sunday morning is important, the whole of the time is important, the whole of the week is important. It's also, it's as much about my presence through you in the community as it is about us coming together, which is crucial that we come together as a family. And we come and we worship together because we are strengthened in that. And we come and encourage each other. But it's more about my presence with you, God is saying, rather than the numbers that you might see at different things. God is saying to Gideon, do you trust the size of your army or do you trust me? I think God is saying to us as a church, do you trust in your resources or do you trust me? And I'm going to take it to an even deeper level. Because I think what God, the message that came to me as I was preparing this quite clearly was, I think God is talking about something very specific. As many of you know, we're struggling with finance in the church. And it's very scary. There's a lot at stake if we run out of money. Kevin and I won't be paid. Candice won't be paid. We won't be able to pay the bills. And the reality is every month, the outgoings are less than the income. This is not me asking you all for more money. Trust me, that is not what this message is about. I think God is saying to us, do you trust the security of your funds more than you trust me? I know that Ken and I tell stories about the amazing ways God has provided for us. And last week I shared one when we were at our weakest. And it really was fantastic to see God provide. And I think sometimes when you hear stories like that, our response can sort of be, well, it's all given off very well for you. You've seen God do it, but you've never done that for me. My challenge to us all is hold that thought and instead ask God, what are you going to do about this? Or what do you want me to do about it? But especially, what, do you want, what are you going to do about it? Vicky often tells great, miracle, encouraging face stories, doesn't she? I'm looking at all these spy ladies. Um, and we're all really encouraged by them. But I know sometimes our response can be, it's all, all very well for Vicky, it happens to her naturally. But that isn't supposed to be our response. Our response is to be encouragement from her for us to be able to go and expect God to do the same thing. How much are we trusting God? And how much are we trusting in ourselves? We have a buffer of a fund which we are having to dip into more and more. There isn't much left. I really think God is saying, how much are you trusting that, or how much are you trusting me? We're in the middle of Lent. Lent is when we focus on Jesus on the cross. We worship a God who emptied himself in order to fight the biggest battle ever. When Jesus died, did God say, well, that's it now, sorry, it's all over, it's the end. It was the end of something, because Jesus said it is finished. But it was the end of the biggest battle that had ever been fought. It was the end of the power that Satan had over the world. That's what was finished. And it was the beginning of a new life for the whole world. Like I said, every month our bills are more than our income. Is God saying it's the end of the spring water? Is that what he said to the Israelites when they were faced with this massive army? Absolutely not. And I don't think he's saying it to us. I think it's, he is saying, as I have said, it's time you trusted in me and not in your own resources. At home group last week, Jules commented on one of her favourite verses. It's possibly a favourite for many of us. It's certainly my mother's favourite. It's from Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And I had a look at that verse, and I have always understood the standard as he will sort of tell you which way to go. Actually means... He will remove all the obstacles that are in the way on the path in front of you. It actually means he's going to clear the path, which in effect tells us which way to go, yes, but it actually the word is he's clearing away those obstacles. And I just 
love that picture because I think that's what God wants to do to clear away the obstacles. Maybe it's fear, maybe it's pride, all sorts of obstacles that might get in our way of what God wants to do here and with us. I think that's what's happening in this story of Gideon. God is getting rid of all the obstacles that are in the way of the Israelites, not living the way he wants them to. It was a rather large army that looked like the biggest obstacle, but actually it was the Israelites' attitude to God that was the biggest obstacle. He had to deal first with their fear and encourage their faith. Did they trust themselves or did they trust God? And their biggest obstacle was their fear. So I have to ask myself, I have to ask us, is fear crippling us? If the Israelites were to beat this army with their own resources, another will come and that same fear will cripple them again. Or they'll become proud. Because that's the other thing that can cripple us. We can be proud about what we've done, what we've achieved, and forget that actually it's God that's done it all. Fear can look so big that we retreat into a corner and we're too scared to do anything. Pride can trip us up. Both stop us seeing what God is doing. But if they, the Israelites, against all odds, the odds of 1 to 450, if they can beat this army in God's strength, their faith in God will deepen and their witness to the world will be more powerful. Exactly what, what he wants for us. And that's exactly what happens. And some of you might be dying to know how the story ends. I'm going to tell you, so even if you're not dying to know, sorry, you're going to hear it. It's a really dramatic ending, where this tiny army barely has to show up. And God shows more of his grace towards Gideon, because he gives Gideon a real boost of encouragement. After he's whittled his army down to almost nothing, he then says, okay, Gideon, go down to the camp and just see what happens. So in the middle of the night, I think it's probably around midnight, Gideon goes down to the camp with one of his men, and he overhears someone saying, I had this dream last night. It was a real nightmare. I dreamt that this massive loaf of barley came down from the Israelite camp and completely squashed our tents. And his friend, the friend he was telling this to said, oh, That's going to be Gideon. They're going to annihilate us. Well, for a start, I found that dream really funny. I mean, it's a loaf of barley. The one thing the Midianites have been doing is destroying the barley crops. And yet, it's a loaf of barley that in this dream comes down and destroys this tent. And Gideon needed to hear that. He needed to finally realize God is going to do what he said he was going to do. And he falls on his knees in worship. Remember at the very start of the story, we talked about the Israelites being on their knees in desperation, asking God to rescue them good place to be if you're in desperation, but now their leader is on his knees in worship. And all he does to his 300 men, he gives them a trumpet and a jar, a clay jar, that had a torch in it. Not the sort of thing you'd expect to give an army to go into battle against 135 people and their camels, would you? One of the things Nikki had got for the kids was she was going to lay out all sorts of different things like a sword and different weapons and put a trumpet and a um, a torch and say, which would you pick? <laughs> I can guarantee what your boys would pick. <laughs> I'm not sure that's what they're actually doing this morning. But he, tell, and he says to them, you need to do what I do. When I blow my trumpet, you blow yours, and you smash your jars, and you shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And that's exactly what he does. They race down the hill towards this massive army, break, blowing their trumpets, breaking their jars, which show the light, and it's dark, remember, so it's still the middle of the night. And the army, the Midianite army starts to panic. They start to kill each other and the rest run away. They barely had to do any fighting. They just pretty much had to be present and obedient. And I love the story of Gideon because it shows God's kindness in our weakness. He doesn't expect anything of us other than obedience. He accepts our weakness. In fact, he prefers our weakness because it allows him to work without us getting in the way. But he meets us where we are, right where we are. And he allows us to be honest with him. Think of how honest Gideon was. Well, it doesn't look like you're with us, God. It's all very well for you to say. It doesn't look like you're with us. I didn't face God. He wants us to be honest. 
He wants us to be able to say, God, it doesn't look like you're doing anything, because then he can say, step back, out of the way, and let me do what I do best. He wants us to trust. And he wants us to obey. I have a very close relative, and every time I compliment her on something that she's done, she says, it's not me, it's God. And I always say, I don't know who it is, but she, and I always say to her, Mum, now you'll know, God still needs a willing vessel. He needs you to say yes before he can use you. It might be all God, but you have to say yes. And what does God tell his army to take into battle? A trumpet, a clay jar with a torch in it, and their voices. So the trumpet was like this. It was a shofar. It's called a shofar. It's basically a ram's horn. And it sounds, if that works. No, it didn't work. That's a pity, because it's a really harsh sound played in a certain way, the shofar. That little thing at the top was supposed to be a video. It worked on my computer, but never mind. <laughs> and a clay jar, which probably looked something like that, and it had the torch in, and that had to be smashed so that the light could shine. Can you imagine what it sounded like, what it looked like? It was a trumpet, a trumpet proclaimed. God's presence on the scene. A light, a light that showed God's presence on the scene. And the deafening sound of the jar breaking, that would have been intimidating. Because although there were 300, at the dead of night, 300 men making that sort of noise is going to be a lot. And it was a shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And for us, it's a shout for the Lord and for his church. Let's take a few minutes, we've got a song that we're going to play, and we will do the offering during that song as well, but when the offering's finished, just take some time just thinking about some of the things, asking God if there's anything that you need to repent of, if there's anything that you need to be looking to him for, because we want to be a church where it's so clear that the victory is the Lord's. Do we have to repent of pride? I know there's plenty of times I think, oh, it's so great what's happening at Springwater. And it is. But it's all because of God. Fear. My fear at numbers going down on a Sunday. I've had to repent of that. We have to remember we are strong only because God is with us. And we do this for the Lord and for his church. Let me pray, and then Mary and Nikki can play that song. Father, my heart's desire is always, always to follow you. But I know I get in the way so many times. And Jesus, my heart's desire is always, always that as a church, we are a place that draw people to you. Where people see you. Where they, we love that when they come, they feel your love, they feel your presence, they feel that hug. We love that, Lord, and we know that is you. And Lord, we ask that you will do what is necessary to draw them closer and closer to you until they follow you themselves. I want to be in that sort of church, Lord, and I know I get in the way. I want to be on my knees knowing that you are the only one who can do what we are asking. And I want to be on my knees in worship of you. In Jesus' name. Amen.